Hey, everybody. This is Jean-Paul Gasser from the band Clutch. And we want to uh, uh, welcome you to episode 16 of Gretsch Generations. Uh, I'm pleased to be here. This is something I haven't done before. Uh, I'll try not to screw it up. Uh, luckily, I've got some backup today, and, and uh, that's my good friend, Caleb Crosby, uh, from the band uh, Tyler Bryant and the Shakedown. Um, I've had the opportunity to spend some time on the road with, with Caleb and his band, and it's been great. Uh, I very much enjoy their music, and hanging with Caleb's been great. We talk about drums and uh, exercises we do, and it's great. So uh, without any further ado, let's bring in Caleb right now. What up, right. JP? Hey, Caleb. How are you, man? Great to see you. Dude, thanks for having me, buddy. I'm Absolutely. just happy to be here. And and right along with you, I haven't done this yet either, so you and I are jumping right in. Let's see what happens here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is great. Yeah, man. It, this this is fun. This is this will give us the opportunity to play, talk about drums and talk about playing and, and uh, maybe talk a little bit about our time on the road. I think that's something that... Um, both you and I know a lot about, and that's, yeah. that's, you know, spending time in the van, traveling miles and, and, uh, you know, loading and unloading our own gear, doing the gig, throwing the gear back in the van and doing it again. Yeah, man. Um, and, you know, I, I think about that now, especially in these times, you know, where, where, uh, young bands don't have the opportunity to get out there and play. And, uh, it's, it's really important that, uh, that, that that bands have that opportunity to be out there because those first those first tours are really crucial in a band's development. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, they were that way for us. I mean, you know, especially all the shows for nobody because that was for us. You know, we were still developing. We were figuring out our sound. We were trying out songs and um, playing all over the place. You know, and and I'm I'm happy we're talking about this now because it's good for me to remember those times because it's been a second since we've been able to be on the road you know and you forget um how fun that is and and um you know so it's good to to look back and and uh, think about that especially like you know 10 years ago when we were doing those early on shows and how important it was for you know our band and figuring out who we were and what we wanted to be you know well i i think about the first time that i saw you play and that was when um when you were on tour with Clutch, actually, Tyler Bryant was 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 opening, um, and I and I'd heard of you guys before, and and that was actually through a, a YouTube video, uh, and at that point, Clutch was looking for um, we were looking for a, diff a new producer. We wanted to do something new. We wanted to record in a different place, and so we we started checking out different guys. And one guy that got my attention was Vance Powell. Yeah, and I can remember watching a YouTube video of him, and he he broke down a little bit about how, how he records a rock band, how he mixes a rock band. And it was really interesting. Uh, he's a great guy, as you know, but I remember listening to the song itself and thinking, wow, this is a really cool tune. And it was catchy. There was a great groove to it. And uh, that was the first time that I actually heard Tyler Bryant and the shakedown play. And, and right away I was a fan. I was like, wow, Vance is a cool guy and he's got good taste in music. This is going to be great. That's awesome, man. Yeah, it was, it was awesome. Uh, and then, of course, we, we, we met on the road and, and we spent a lot of time out there together. So um, I'm pleased to be, to be able to have spent so much time watching you play and watching your band play. And it's been awesome. Well, Van, well Vance is the best. And I think are, are you, you're talking about the, um, the Loaded Dice video, I think, right? I, th I think, well, maybe that's what it was. It, it was it was a video in, in which he, he talked a little bit about how he mixes a band and how he, how he breaks down uh, miking the instruments, and, and you guys were, were that band. And I, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, he's, yeah he's great, man. Um, I think, like, in the studio, um, you know, it's been, a, it's been a minute since we've made a record with him, but uh, he, he is the best and a wizard with getting sounds and just the way that he approaches mixing. And for us, we love tracking live. And for, for him, he loves that challenge of throwing a band in a room and figuring out how to make it work. And so for us, it's like, all right, let's act like we're basically on stage on tour, you know, let's capture that raw organic energy. How can we do that? And so it's like throwing paint with, with Vance. And he's got a great setup with all of us where we can see each other and the amps kind of are, you know, the drums bleed into the amps and, you know, everything's just kind of like um, just raw and loud and awesome. And so for, for mixing, it's interesting because when he goes through and solos certain things, you're getting that bleed 
but it's like, you know, old records that we love because it's not, all right, let's get a really direct drum sound. It's let's get everything in the room bleeding together. And um, I think for us, it really captured that energy that we were going for. For sure. I, I think he's really great at, at taking, uh, making a document of the entire band, the whole sound that's happening all at once. And you're the, right. The it's not, snapshot, right? Yeah. 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 yeah, and it's not just about like, hey, let's get a let's get a uh, you know a, a snare mic and be sure that you only get the snare drum. I, I think you know he uses all those microphones in conjunction with one another to paint the bigger picture. Yeah, exactly. And one thing he does a lot too that I that I love that was really fun is he's got this, and as you remember, he's got that wall of pedals, right? All the guitar pedals. And so we did a lot of. Uh, I don't think this was in reference to the video you were talking about, but there were a lot of moments where we would be like, all right, let's get some crazy, like, um, loud, like, you know, almost like a cymbal sound. And he would be like, hey, go in there and just hit your snare like as possible, as hard as you possibly can. So it's basically like me standing up and going just like this, like almost like I'm swinging a hammer. And so then through that, it's, you know, maybe he's, you know, throwing it through three or four microphones, but then throwing it through these effects pedals and getting this, like basically making a, a loud, cracky snare sound like, a big open like gong right where it's like so the sound is really off color and you're like what is what is that no what is that sound that i'm hearing and so that was really fun just because his palette is so big and his like uh the way that he gets to certain sounds is so um you know different than most and so i really loved that because it felt like there were these certain colors that you were hearing that you're going trying to identify going wow what what is that? What am I, what exactly am I hearing? You know? And I love that about Vance because he was great. I could honestly sit here and talk stories about Vance forever. Cause there's so many funny like moments where, you know, he's like yelling at me through the talk back, like you got, you got to stop hitting the symbols, man. You got to stop hitting the symbols. <laughs> and it's the, my, one of my favorite quotes is like the worst thing that ever happened to drummers are symbols. The worst yeah. thing, I, you know? And so um, I remember one time I'll tell you a quick story just on, along that vein. We were, we were trying, Tyler and I were trying to get somewhere and we were working on this song. We were trying to just get a vibe. And um, I remember him stopping midway through and, and coming over the top back and going, Caleb, like, it sounds like you're walking through a junkyard. Why, why, <laughs> why, why, what are, what are you hitting in there? And I was like, you know, just getting sounds. And I was like, you know, hitting the sides of cymbals and maybe some scrapes and just like kind of getting a vibe. He's like, can you just, just stop doing that? And I remember his assistant comes in and pulls all the symbols off the stands, right? And sets them on the ground and goes, all right, let's do another pass. <laughs> <laughs> so there's been moments like that where it's like, you know, you figure out these other colors to, to all right, cool, let's play on the rim. Or, you know, that he's taped a bunch of stuff to my arms. And so you got these like jingles and, you know, just to, just to get like left to center things that like uh, to get to a certain point that is, not standard, you know, and I love that about him is he would kind of pull you out of the norm and pull you out of like what you're used to and what you're used to hearing, what you're used to playing and going, let's like, let's get there another way. What if we took this Avenue instead? And that was inspiring um, for us, you know, and, I, and it's not just for me as a drummer, it was for all of us. Like um, how can we get to this point um, in a, in a different way, a more inspiring way, a more creative way, you know? Yeah, for sure. Uh, and and along those lines, I, th I think he's also very in tune with the studio and the gear that he has, and he has a way of sort of manipulating that stuff. It, it's as if he plays it like as if, as if it were an instrument. Yeah, uh, it, is, it is. It is his instrument, right? Yeah. I mean, that's how he that's how he uh, creates. And and watching him in the element is inspiring, right? Just For standing sure. behind him and watching how he works. But yeah, I totally agree. I think we might have that video. Um, let's see if we can pull the video up that, that uh, I was talking about, the first one that I saw. Do we have that available? Yeah. Here we go. There he is. Yes. Now, this is just the tracks, basic tracks. And um, if you look on my session, you'll see that on the session, there's uh, really no edit. Uh, the reason for that being is uh, the band plays really well. The drummer's really great. And uh, I just didn't feel like it needed editing. It did play to a click. Um, and it, it was just, it was a great tape. Um, I think that uh, looking at the time code to start. 
Well, that's high, that high praise coming from Vance. I, I appreciate that. No, no doubt about it. Getting compliments like that from Vance don't happen every day. And so I'll you, take it, man. I'll take I'd be it. Proud of that as well. Yeah. Well, and I think that approach for us is important. And to be honest, along those lines, like there were times where we would get a take and we obviously were going for a full band take and we would do, you know, dozens and dozens and maybe not get there and maybe come back the next day and go, actually, you know what, that, that one, like take, take 20 something. That was, I think that was the one. And maybe the drums were like, not exactly what I was going for. There was a happy accident or something in there that I would learn to love over time. Right. Where it's kind of like, I, I don't know that I would play that again, but I, I kind of like that. And then it becomes the part. Right. And then I'm, I'm replicating that live. And there's something to be said about that to where, um, you know, there's those moments that happen in the moment that um, are special and they're meant to be captured. And we're talking about that snapshot thing to where it's not just like, all right, let's get a program. Let's just play and like see what happens. So, yeah, we may be tethered to a click, but we're not talking about form. And maybe there's a weird like turn and, and somebody goes an extra. I go an extra like over the bar line fill or something that just is is cool and unique. It, yeah, it, it adds to the to the to the bigger picture of, of the album. And, yeah. uh, you know, in, in, a, in a lot of ways, I think Vance has a lot to do with with the album that we made for him, for sure. Uh, making that album unique. And, and, and I think it stands apart from other clutch records that we've made. So and that's how we even got to go on the road with you guys was really through that connection with Vance and and um, you guys making that record, which was what? Is that 2018? That was right? 2018. Yeah. Right. So the book of bad decisions. And then you guys did the tour. Um, and we were asked to come along, which was awesome. And so some of the first, uh, you know, my first impressions of you playing were um, on that tour. And I know that we have some videos of that because, and I think they're short little clips, but like just me side stage. I think one of them that we have is from the second gig and you've got a guest percussionist with you guys who yeah. you're going to have to say his name. That would, that would be Mike Dillon. Okay. And so really cool. And like his whole approach was just awesome. And it was really neat to see you guys with that kind of color. Um, because I think those like syncopated rhythms are so important for certain songs. Um, so I, I know this one from Kansas city has that. Let's check it out. So sick. So sick. And I love my, my favorite is that big fill and land on the and the, the lean is just awesome. And it's just <laughs> like, you. I love it, man. Um, but no, I loved watching him. And, and I don't know if that was his, I can't remember if that was his only show or if he did a couple. Um, yeah, but, Mike, uh, Mike comes out from time to time and uh, he sits in whenever possible. Uh, I, I had the opportunity to go on tour with Mike actually for a, a few shows last year, right before this whole thing started. Uh, I was very, very fortunate to be able to do that and play with him. Uh, he's we'll an interesting. He's ahead. an interesting guy. He, he's he's from Dallas uh, or from Texas, um, but very early on he was exposed to DC go go music, which is something that I I grew up with, and I didn't even realize it was indigenous to DC at the time. Uh, a lot of people uh, kind of waited for go go to become this sort of national. Mm -hmm thing and it never really broke out of dc um but growing up i was exposed to those rhythms early on and and i didn't realize just how local it was until i actually started going on tour and and telling other people about these great go-go bands that i would hear either on the radio or sometimes i had the opportunity to go see them play right and uh i met mike and mike knew about dc go-go so right away we had that connection and and because of that you know we've stayed friends and and we 
we uh, play whenever we can, and whenever he's available, he comes out and, and jams with Clutch, and he helps us get that sort of that that go go vibe going. Yeah, it's it was so cool because I mean I, I I love you guys you know as your your core four piece, but like having that extra added element of syncopation here and there, and and watching him too, it was fun because he was just like feeling it and just going for whatever he was feeling, and that was cool like being a drummer to see your guys's reaction and how you're uh, communicating and playing off of each other. And that was really cool. And I, and this was, this was the second show. Cause I went back and looked um, when we sent these videos in. Yeah. And so for me, it was, it was really cool. I mean, we were obviously just stoked to be on the run and, um, and we had lived with the record and loved the record. And I know that was an older song, but um, yeah, man, I don't know. Just for me, it was really cool to watch. And I remember just like, standing there the whole time that because we got to go up and, and it was like blocked off and I just like stood there the whole time with my phone you know watching and it was cool man I love that tour so much and and um you know one of one of the things that I remember that I feel like we should talk about or I want to talk about is your practice routine um and how you get ready how you prepare for shows um because you've got your separate little kit set up in your um in your truck and man it was like so inspiring and you didn't know it half the time but i would we'd be loading in you know out of our van or something and setting up we'd be stuck in the parking lot setting up our gear or something and i would just be listening to you and just watch just sit there and watch you read syncopation or something you know and and it was and it was awesome man and, and your routine really inspired me um just on how you prepare mentally um physically right how you get ready and how you warm up so I'd love to hear you talk about that, if you wouldn't mind. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, w when we're on the road, there there is a lot of downtime, especially in the way that we travel now. You know, back in the day when we were in the van, we spent most of our hours actually driving from gig to gig. Uh, we're, we're fortunate in that we have a tour bus these days. And so uh, we drive at night and get to the gig, you know, early in the morning. And um, I don't know if the folks out there realize, like, how much, how much time you really spend at the venue – before and after the gigs, you know? I feel like the the saying that we always say, it's the hurry up and wait, right? So it's like, get, 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 get. and then you're there and you're like, oh wait, we, we have nine hours or 10 hours until we play, right? right. <laughs> you know, it's like, what do we do, you know? That's that's it, and 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 for me, you know, I, I enjoy I enjoy practicing, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's fun for me. I, uh, I find it to be meditative in a lot of ways and, and being on the road for as many days out of the year as we are, anytime you can find those moments that are sort of, uh, they, they just, it gets you away from people, it gets you away from the noise and the racket that, that is being on the road. Um, and you can kind of just zone in on maybe a page of syncopation, as you said, or a page of stick control. Or maybe just a YouTube video. You know, I'll do that a lot right. too. I'll just get on YouTube and uh, some random drum video will come up. You know, some kid's got something to show, man. He's got, he's got, you know, something to share. And uh, so I might just pick, you know, something that he's, he's doing or she's doing. And so I, I like to spend a lot of hours like that. I, I will say as many hours as I spend out there practicing, a lot of it's not really focused. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've until recently I've, I've been sort of like, I've been the kind of guy that's been like, okay, well, this is what I want to practice right now. So I'll work on that for a day or two or three days or whatever it is. And then something else will come up. And I'll be like, Oh no, this is really what I need. This is really the important thing I need to be working on right now. Right. So, uh, I, one thing good that's come out of this, out of this, uh, this pandemic is been for me being able to devote a little bit of time in, um, and sort of focusing myself a little bit. Right. Uh, so I, I've actually started taking drum lessons from Dom Famulero. Oh, wow. So cool. Love yeah, that. It's been great. It's, it's been incredible. And he's helped me focus a lot on uh, really on just tech technique, you know, and, and being able to uh, understand what it means to play a free stroke. What does it mean to play, play molar, you know, informal, yeah. formal, um, so all this stuff has been really great and it's been, it's been helpful to me in, in focusing my practice. And now I find that the techniques I use, uh, to practice those lessons that he gives me are now applying to other parts of, uh, of stuff that I like to practice, whether it's syncopation or, uh, or anything else that comes up. Right. Yeah. It's funny how that works. And I feel like 
I see that all the time from things that I um, maybe worked on in college. You know, I studied a lot with Chester Thompson and we would take all these swing exercises that we would play this way. And then you would switch them and play in left hand lead. Oh. And at the time, you know, I'm going this, it, it didn't feel like busy work, but part of it was kind of like, Oh, we're just doing it to do it. And then, in retrospect or looking back, I'm going, I'm realizing how much more free I am with my hands and how had I not done that work or put that work in. And again, at the time I'm young, I'm going, wait, I want to learn, you know, something fast or something that's more in my vein. You know what I mean? So I think that like, um, the non-focused practice can be good because you, you're looking back and I'm not saying that was, wasn't focused. I'm just saying, you know, when you're kind of throwing paint to see what sticks, you know, you're coming back to those certain things and going, oh, wait, so so that's actually applying to what I'm doing now. Right. Yeah, ag- agreed. I, I think oftentimes you don't you don't understand the value of a certain exercise or or a, a certain page. Uh, maybe you don't understand that for, you know, months or even even years. But but all this stuff that, that we pick up along the way, uh, I think eventually leads leads into into your playing one way or another. Right. Right on. Thanks, Chad. Um, I'm, I'm starting to see these like little comments oh, come cool. across the, the bottom here. Nice. Now, but before we like, uh, I think because I think we we're talking about the road, but I want to ask you uh, like a, a more specific question on how you approach. Because one of my favorite books practicing is Syncopation. And I knew that on the road and I will say real quick, um, I actually when we were on the road together, I was so inspired by your dedicated and diligent practice. And I obviously didn't have that luxury of having a, a, a kit where I could do the things you were doing um, one day, we hope. Um, but I was inspired and I was like, how can I be more inspired to like practice? So I bought a new pad. I bought one of these reflex pads. I nice. was like, I need, I was like, I need something. And I had it shipped to the venue. I need something to like, you know, feel different. I need like something when I'm like warming up, I, I want it to feel different. And at the time these were like hip and everybody was buying them. So I was like, all right, I'm going to get one. So I have you to thank for that because I, I, I needed that. I needed that like push, you know, from you um, watching you and seeing you like the diligence that you put into that. Um, because it really, it, it, it really did like resonate with me and just how you, um, you know, our warm up for a show and, and how you practice and how you kind of spend the downtime that you do have. But my question is, is um, how, what are some things that you do with syncopation and um, you know, some of the ways you apply it to um, warming up or practicing? Sure. Um, well, the, 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 the first way to look at, at those pages uh, for me anyway, would, would be to um, play time with your right hand, uh, maybe maybe just quarters. It doesn't necessarily even have to be a swing pattern, you know. Play quarters in your right hand, quarters in the bass drum, and then close your hi hat on two and four. Right. Mm-hmm. So now we're just playing time, boom, mm-hmm. boom, and that in itself, just getting that together is that's quite a challenge, you know. That, right. The idea of making sure that all all these things land at the same time, um, that there's a clean sound, and that there's a balance in the in the volume of, of mm-hmm. the overall time, you know? Right. And then, um, once that starts to feel good, we take some of those pages out of syncopation and play those figures in the left hand, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, again, you, you, you're thinking about, uh, the balance in the sound. You don't want, you don't want one thing to be way louder than another, unless that's the intended sound, you know? Right. If right. But, but for the most part, we want to have a good balance and you want to keep that sound happening. And I, and I find that to be, um, as challenging sometimes, or if not more than the actual independence part of, of playing these things with the left hand. Right. Right. So that, that's, that's sort of the first way of doing it. And then, and then we can do the same thing with the bass drum. Bass drum plays those lines. Um, the, the ones that are really fun for me are, are when we start to look at those, those eighth notes as jazz eighth notes or swung eighth notes. And right. we start filling in the triplets that are not on the page, all the triplets that are in between those notes. And so that's where the really, for me, that's where the fun stuff really starts to happen. You right. can you yeah. can play the figure in your left hand and then fill the bass drums in, or the opposite, play the play the figure with your bass drum and then fill in with your left hand. Um, so th- these are just a couple of ways of looking at it. But once you unlock that that's that kind of that kind of uh, approach, 
then it then the then it's really limitless. You can you can really start making up your own exercises, and I do that often. There, maybe there's a, a new clutch song, and I'm trying to think of a new way to maybe play the verse or whatever. Uh, maybe there's a there's a thing that I'm having a little bit of trouble with. You know, uh, I'll I'll take a page out of syncopation and I'll isolate whatever that thing is that I'm trying to work on. Whether it's mm -hmm. speed, whether it's trying to put uh, a bass drum in a place where you might not normally do it. But take some of those pages and you can make exercises out of these things. And so in that way, you can kind of teach yourself. And I think that's my the other thing I really love about syncopation is that that it's not the kind of book that says, OK, this is the ride symbol. Here's the left hand. Right. You play this Latin pattern over here. It's not that it's what you want it to be. I think it is helpful, though, having somebody who can walk you through uh, at least a few pages of it and get you to sort of be able to look and, and read between the notes a little bit. Right. Um, but you know that that's that's my favorite book. If if uh, if I go on tour, sometimes that is the only book I will take with me. Yeah, and I and I, I completely agree. And that's why I wanted to ask you that question on this. It's like been the one question that I wanted to ask you when we when I knew we were doing this because I love books that are beyond the page, right? Not like okay, here's what you play and here's how you play it and here's how the feel goes. It's all right. Here's some rhythms to inspire you. Here's some rhythms to be creative. You figure out how you voice them. You figure out how you orchestrate them. And then that's kind of so it's like, oh, cool. If you take the eighth notes and you swing them or if you if you play them straight and you play some like, um, you know, maybe you do a da -da -da, da -da -da, da -da -da on the hi hat. And then all of a sudden the and then you play the rhythms double time. That's one thing I love when you get into like later half of the book, you start to read them cut time. Right. Yeah. And then so you're playing everything like 16th technically. So you're playing it over top. So then all the. um the rhythms kind of overlap. And so that's really cool. Or you, you do vice versa, one and a two and a three and a four and a, right. Like something like that. Um, and so then it becomes this other thing. And then, and then it's almost like inspiring like a groove and then you're like, Oh, and then you grab like certain bars. And you're like, Oh, actually that one mixed with that one is kind of a cool thing. Sure. You know? Yeah. So it's like you, you have like things like that. And, and that's why I love that book because it's not just like, all right, cool. Yeah. I played all these rhythms all the way through front to back. Yeah, You know, because you can basically do that right when you start playing drums. You know what right. I mean? But yeah. it's it's the in between the notes, like you said, like how how can we, um, you know, put this in the kit to where we can. Um, and, I, and I do love that you can write your own exercise with it. So it's awesome. <laughs> it, 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 is, it is great that way. And, yeah. and, and, and you know, another another part of it, too, is that it, it helps you. Uh, it, it it helps you articulate all of the things that it is you want to play. In other words, all of the syllables in the in the beat, if you want to call it that, or you you say all of those things. Not you, you don't play those pages because ultimately you're going to take it to band practice and going to be like, guys, check it out. I got this yeah, thirty-two yeah, yeah, more sure. beat. Here we go. You ready? It's going to be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's, not that. it's not that. It 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 exercises your your brain in a way that 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 you don't normally get to do when you're just jamming with your buddies. You know. Right. Uh, and so hopefully that that sort of expands the way you hear rhythm and the way that you, you hear the music around you. Um, so, yeah, it's it's it's, it's great. And, and I don't I, when that book was written, I'm not sure that it was intended to be as, as deep as it really was. You know, yeah. it, it, it's it's I think over generations, drummers have been able to look at that book and just interpret it in different ways. And that that makes it a really beautiful thing. Yeah, correct. And I think that's why it's important to figure out how it is that you interpret it or how it is that I interpret it because it for everyone it's like oh well I've never thought about it like that you know I know when we did a bunch of shows with the rival sons Miley and I had this conversation you know and it's the same deal he's like oh well I take it actually and and maybe fill in but all the accents are swung and you're playing like a big band right and you're playing all the accents with the kick and the ride crashing but still around and so I was like oh and then so I'm going like wow, how do I, and so I'm like on my practice pad going, you know, so there's just so many ways. And I think that's why the book is just so far superior, you know, as for sure. Say. For sure. And, but you know, you, you gotta love it, man. You got, you gotta love spending time with it. It's not, it's, it's not for everybody. I, I remember yeah. doing an interview one time uh, and uh, we were, we were in Germany and, and um, the guy mentioned something about, uh, you know, I understand you spend a lot of, a lot of time, uh, practicing he says is he said isn't this boring for you and mm. i said well only if you find practice boring yeah you know my, uh, mike dylan will say that practice is a party right right <laughs> <laughs> i love that that's you good. know and and, yeah. and 
Yeah. So, I mean, you, and you, you gotta, you, you gotta really love it. You gotta jump into this thing with both feet. You know, the, I feel like the drums requires that of you. At least it does for me. If I don't play drums for a day or two and I sit down at the kit, I, I feel like I, I can't play anything. You, you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, the, the drum, the drums, I think requires that of you. You gotta, you gotta spend some time with it a little bit every day. You have to think about the drums. You have to, you have to think about the music. You gotta listen to drummers that you like, you know, and keep that inspiration going. I'm, i uh, you know, we've been around now for 30 years, this band. And, and I am so fortunate to, to, to be able to do what we do. And I, I want to, I want to, I don't want to take that for granted. Mm -hmm. I, I want to every minute that I can spending on this instrument back here. That's, that's what I want to do. And so I, you know, I, I base my day around that, you know, I try to practice first thing in the morning, think about band practice later that day. What is it we're going to do? You got to really make it the number one thing in your life. If you're going to, if you, if, if, if you want to make music, your, your, your passion and your, and your job, you got to jump in with both feet. Yeah, you do. I, I agree. And I think that, you know, what you just said, that you feel that and you see that when you go and see your band play, it's that way for everyone. It's like you're, you're getting a, a, an experience and, and you guys take it seriously. And it's not about um, something else or it's not about like what you look like. It's about what you're doing and how you're communicating and how you're, um, you know, showing it to other people. And I think that we, you know, we've really um, early on, you know, when we put our band together, it was like, we all had to be in line with that. You know, it was like, Hey, this is like what we're doing and this is our goal and, and we're doing this. So you in or you out, you know? Right. And, and I think it's important, you know, cause it, it's good to be with people that are level headed and you keep people accountable and keep people in check. And it's like, Hey, you're out, you bring them back in, you know, and, mm -hmm. and you have to have that in a band, you know? And um, I think that's unique in our situation. Um, you know, I live in Nashville and a lot of people in Nashville are hired guys and it's a different thing. You're hired to do a, a, a job and you're hired to play specific parts and you show up and you play the parts and, and that's a thing. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's different being in a band when you all have equal ownership and partnership and equal say in what you do and, and, and how you do it and, and how you play it. And, you know, maybe those are, are conflicting and you work it out and it's like, oh, let's do it this way. No, let's do it this way, you know. And so but that's the joy of it. That's the beauty of all of it. It's the it's the process. You have, right. to, you have to enjoy the process of it. You know, it's not it's not just about getting to that, whatever that goal is. It's 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 what happens on the way to, to getting there that I, yeah. I think is you got You got to learn to really embrace that and enjoy that. I completely agree. Completely agree. That's great. That's good. That's you really you guys have, have spent a lot of time on the road uh, opening for some, some pretty well-known bands out there. Uh, I, I, I was noticing that you guys actually did dates with ACDC. Yeah, we did. Um, we did a whole uh, world tour with ACDC. It was actually the first time that we ever went to Europe. And this was back in 2016. And so we we um, it's actually a funny story. We, we were we were on the road with Billy Gibbons and we were actually playing acoustic. For Billy Gibbons, he he had put out his solo record. Um, I can't remember what the record was called, but it was like two drummers. Mm -hmm. um, it was a really strange band, but really, I mean, Bill anything Billy does is cool, right? So like Billy's Billy, the King of Cool is what we call him. Um, but we were on this tour, and they had six inputs. So you know, I got that gong drum, which we'll I'm sure we'll talk about later in the setup. Yeah. Um, so that was basically what I was playing. Uh, I had a 52 like mounted in there. I had that and a, a crash cymbal. And uh, Noah, our bass player, acoustic bass, you know, two guitars and two vocal mics. That was like basically our setup. And so we did a whole tour that way. Um, and it was it was really interesting. And um, we got a call on that tour that said, hey, there's an opportunity that's opened up. Um, would you guys like to go on the road with ACDC? Like they had to ask. Right. Yeah, and so right. so we were like freaked out, obviously. And um we had to, I mean, to make a long story short, we had to get back to Nashville, but we were also trying to get our electric gear together. We hadn't played electric in, you know, three and a half months, but we yeah. were, we were, um, you know, highly recommended for this gig. And we basically got three shows to, to um, prove ourselves, let's say, or really prove ourselves to Angus is really what it was. And um, so we drove from Nashville in our van, from Nashville to Spokane, Washington was where the first show was. No, no, that's not right. Uh, Tacoma, Washington is where it was. And it was a 40, 
three hour drive, took us three days, and we drove through three blizzards on the way. And this was February, right? So of 2016. We get there, man, I'll never forget. We we um walk through the doors and the techs are playing back in black. And it was like like mind blowing. So we we play the shows and it was, you know, like nothing we'd ever experienced before. We don't we'd done a couple arena shows for festivals and stuff like that, but never like a like a full on like, hey, you have I think we were doing 45 minutes at the time. We did a couple of hour slots, but most of it's 45 minutes, which is a great opening slot. I mean, that's that's perfect. And uh, we were the only opening band. So, I mean, it was like just throwing us in. Like, here you go, throwing us to the wolves. And and we were living for it, man. We were just so excited and also learning along the way. So three shows turned into Let's Finish the U.S. Run, which was 20 total shows. And halfway through, this was with Brian Johnson, halfway through, there was a 10-day break, and we actually were booked for a cruise, and it just perfectly worked around our schedule. And um, we found out that Brian lost his hearing. So the rest of the tour was canceled. Europe was being put on hold. And essentially, we lost all our work like we just did last year, as we all can, you know, feel that sentiment. And and it was a bummer because I think we were on such a high. Um, well, we definitely were. But I remember getting the call from our management that it happened. And um, so I remember flying out to California and my wife's from there. And so we were visiting family because um, we had some time. And so call for management. Hey, Axel Rose is going to he's auditioning with ACDC right now. And all of us were like, no way. There's, there's no way. Right, right. And so sure enough, it happened and Europe was on. And so we had booked a bunch of headlining shows around the ACDC shows. And, um, and it, it's really like looking back, I'm, we're grateful because that's essentially what got us over there. And that's essentially what got our name over there. We, we couldn't afford it otherwise, you know, to do a headlining run. We would just lost too much. And, and so that got us over there. We were able to play shows in just every, every, I mean, I think we played 12 countries in seven weeks or maybe even more than that. I can't remember, but yeah, first, first uh, show in Europe was we did like a little warm up gig in Milton Keynes, like right outside of London, Sure. a uh, tiny little uh, club called the Crawford Arms. And then, uh, Two days later, we played for 65,000 people with ACDC in a big parking lot in, Li in Lisbon, Portugal. Wow. And, and honestly, really to this day, it was one of my favorite moments ever because I think there was so much um, building to that, that we were so nervous. And obviously, it was Axel's first show, so there was a lot of um, press and hype around it. Like, you know, is he going to deliver? Is he not? Is he, you know, and there was just so much and for us it was like you know we we got to be uh, tyler always says we're the the plastic wrap to the cd that the fans can't wait to get off right that's like <laughs> that's like kind of like how yeah. the opening you know thing is and so we yeah. got to get up there and, and and make it hard for them to get it off you know and so um that's kind of it was our mentality it's like going in and and take no prisoners like everybody from the first person that you can see to the to the person as far as as it goes and and a lot of these shows like you know it was overwhelming for us we're explaining clubs you know what i mean so it's like it's crazy when you're you know you're setting up and you're going a lot, a lot of these shows we, we didn't get much of a sound check which was fine we were just happy to be there man it was like i, I don't care if, if my drums are half set up we're playing you know yeah. and so um but yeah man a, a lot of really unbelievable stories and a lot that we learned, man. I mean, I felt like we were going to school every night. I mean, I, I there wasn't a second that I missed. I mean, honestly, you're, same deal. When we approach any tour, we, I love watching the bands that we tour with because that's how we learn. We learn from uh, transitions between songs, how you build a set list when you change it every night, how do you, you know, flow. It's like, there's so much that goes into putting on a show production, everything. So it's like, for us, it's, it really is like going to, to school and we approach every tour that way. It's, it's, how can we learn? How can we learn more? What can we get? And you learn something different in every scenario. Um, so yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. And, and that led to touring with Guns N' Roses and we did, you know, played all around the world with them. And, and um, yeah, it's been, it's been a whirlwind, you know, several years. Um, yeah, it's been pretty cool. That's great. That's great. Was uh, was Phil Rudd playing drums at the time? No, Chris Slade was playing drums. Okay. Yeah. So he, you well, know, freight, freight. Yeah. No. No. Like freight train. You know. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, he's he's getting up there. I mean, shoot, he's in his seventies, uh, I think, or like right around there. But dude, I'm telling you, man, it's like you, you talk to him backstage, and you're like, 
whoa, man, like you're playing two hours and 45 minutes. And see, guns, man, they, they were setting records in some of these stadiums. They're playing three hours, 45 minutes. And it's like, oh dude, you know, Frank uh, Ferrer is up there playing drums and, and he's got people that are massaging him, you know, like in the little, you know, slash is doing a solo. He's got like getting worked out. I'm like, dude, think about doing that. I mean, of course they have some days off, but man, that's like some serious, you know, that is some serious um, stamina, you know? Yes, that's, it's well i can't imagine playing for that many I, i'm good after about 90 minutes i'm tapping out man yeah man it's like it's a lot you know and it, it, it really is and so when you when you get up to those you know th the three hour mark man it's like i remember going to see spring scene several years back here in nashville and and watching max play and it's like i mean dude i, I swear to you they played four hours i mean it was just like requests like people were holding up signs it was like cool we'll play that he calls out a key and and i mean of course that band's like just the next level but it's like, you know, it's, it's pretty unbelievable, um, you know, how you prepare for that and how you're able to deliver and bring it for that long, you know. Do, do you guys think about the show differently if you're opening for a band like ACDC as opposed to if you're if you're playing, uh, you know, a, a, a gig in a, in, a, in a club? Yeah, I, I think you do. I, I Well, to, to some degree, the mentality is the same, right? Because it is still that, like, take no prisoners kind of thing. We, we kind of, like, base ourselves on that. It's like, all right, here we go. We're, we're diving in head first. But, yeah, I think, you know, for us, and, and we learned this, you know, um, being in that slot, all right, you have, you know, however long they give you on stage, um, you know, we, we didn't rely on production. We didn't have the production. It was, you know, it was minimal. I mean, it was just us playing, you know, uh, loud, live rock and roll, you know what I mean? And so for us, it's all right, how can we don't want any dead space, you know, because that's like the second that they get distracted and it's, oh, I'm going to the bathroom, I'm going to buy beer or whatever. You know what I mean? It's like, don't give them a chance. yeah, don't. right, exactly. And it's, let's just bring it. So we, we, we really did a lot of, um, interaction like crowd interaction whether it was um you know if we were in spain like tyler would learn the soccer chant you know to like just get that you know give them things that 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 they know and can relate to and so yeah i mean i felt like every place that we would go we would um try and incorporate or utilize certain things like that but yeah it was it was like we we call it maybe this isn't appropriate to say but we we balls to the wall that's like yeah. the, that's how that's how we do the show when we're opening for a, a band like that it's like don't give them a, a chance to get sleepy you know it's it's just full-on energy the whole time so um that's that's kind of how we would approach it that's great I, you know i i i sense that when when uh when you guys open for clutch say, hey uh, same deal when we're opening for clutch balls of the wall we're going you know yeah and and we've we've had a lot of different kinds of bands open for us um and sometimes not even bands sometimes just maybe it's just one guy in a banjo or one guy in a guitar um and i i think one of the one of the things that i i like most um is is watching clutch fans hear something new and appreciate it and Almost always, if the band gets up there and just they just play from their hearts, if they just mean what it is they're playing, clutch fans will will appreciate that. They'll they'll latch onto it and they'll they'll appreciate it for what it is. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't it doesn't have to sound like clutch. It can be something completely different. Um, but I'm proud of that. I, I I think our our fan base uh, they can they can smell they can smell BS from a mile yes. away. And, yes. and when when they when they smell it. It's over with. <laughs> They're done. Yeah. And, and honestly, I, you should be proud of that because we noticed that very early on. It's like, you know, it's, it's true music fans. That's that's kind of how we say it. It's like, you know, it's like these people show up for um, for the experience, you know, for the ride. Maybe it, it maybe they don't love the band, but they love the music or they love music in general. So it's like they're there for the experience. They're not, all right, I'm showing up. When is Clutch going? You know, and, and that was really cool because the room was packed every time we played, you know, and, and that was really fun for us because it was like, oh, these guys are, they're here to have a good time, you know? And so, um, and uh, speaking along the, if you play from the heart or if you, if you're true or honest about what you're, uh, communicating, then people pick up on that. You know, we, we learned that early on too. It's, it's, again, it's, it's in it for the right reasons and not like trying to put up some sort of, uh, facade or trying to be something that you're not, you know, that's, that's not at all what we've been about, you know, since day one. And again, that was established early on and it has to be.
you know, because people can sniff it, man. Like you said, they sniff the BS early. So um, if you're if you're if you're honest and you're true and 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 what you're doing is is coming from the right place, and you know, people you know will enjoy it. Yeah. Well, you yeah. hope they do. <laughs> no, I, I think I, I think there's there's a lot of truth in that, um, and and I also think too, you know, you we we musicians you know we get out there and every day is a little different for us there's this some days are better than others some days you feel better than others some days you're tired some days you can't hear anything maybe the monitors are not the way you want them to be um you know maybe uh maybe ticket sales aren't what you want them to be whatever the case right. might be but but it's our job i think to get up there and play with the same intensity, regardless of the amount of people that are out there or how many tickets were sold or whether, you know, whether you, you don't feel great because you had too many beers last night, you know, the people out there don't want to hear about that. Right. I mean, the they're, they're are, paying money to see the show that they want to see. Right. That, that, that's, that's right. That's it's right. not and, about what day you've had or, 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 you know, what kind of bad day you've had. It's, it's all about, and it's, and, and that, that's challenging. I mean, honestly, I mean, we, we've been there. It's like, Man, I'm I'm tired. I just don't feel like bringing it. And mentally, you have to you have to get there. You have to get there because people are coming to see you play, and and it's important for you to deliver because otherwise they won't show up the next time. That's right. Right. And I've right. I've been that person where it's like, hey, I want to go see a band play, and you know, I mean, I I, I won't say names, but I remember first moving to Nashville, and I loved this songwriter. And I went to see him play, and he was hammered the whole time he was playing. And I, I never listened to his music again. Yeah. Because he didn't take he, the shows, he didn't take it seriously. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's important because regardless of what's going on with you or, or in your scenario or how good you feel or don't feel, you know, it, it, it really doesn't matter. Like the show has to be, all right, get through the show and then deal with whatever. You that's know? right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's good, man. It's good. You know, they were, they, uh, Fetch kind of they, they give us these couple things here to talk about here and there. You know, and <laughs> one of them back that's, here why, was, that's why our eyes are going like. Yeah, well, <laughs> and and I was looking at this one here, favorite road stories, and you know it's it's kind of it's it's hard sometimes to remember you know everything that happens because there's so much craziness that happens throughout our day. I can I can remember uh, doing a doing an interview one time with, with Dave Brocky, the singer from Guar. He and I both were there and there was an interviewer asking us questions. And this interviewer asked Dave Brocky, he said, um, he said, what's, what's the craziest thing that ever happened to you on the road? And Dave had the best response I'd ever heard. And he, and he said, he said, the craziest thing that ever happens is when we get to the gig on time, uh, the dressing room is set up, the PA works, uh, the, the tickets get sold, and the promoter pays us what we're supposed to get paid. Right. That's right. the craziest thing that could ever happen. Right. All the other stuff that happens on 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 the road, you know, whether it's fans freaking out or or you know, uh, a tire that gets that you know blows out on the bus or whatever. I mean, that's just normal everyday stuff. Totally. And after a while, you sort of become immune to that to the craziness. Yeah, I think you do. I think you kind of have to. To be honest, I think it's the only way to make it through it. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like a, like a mental callus that you have to build yeah, up. <laughs> for sure. For sure. What are, what are some of your most uh, like memorable shows that you guys have played? Like in your, in your long career, like what are, what are some, when you look back on the shows that you guys have done all over the place, like what are the, uh, the select few that really stick out that you remember, whether it was a, you guys like really brought it or you remember the crowd or a particular festival or whatever. Well, I can, I can remember playing Detroit early on in our career. Um, maybe we were around for maybe a year even. And I remember being able to go to Detroit and there was like, there was a couple hundred people there and we thought, Holy smokes, man, we, we've made it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, was, that was, that was a great feeling. And, and ever since then, Detroit's always been a, a sort of a high point for us. Whenever we see the itinerary and we see Detroit on there, we know it's going to be a good show. We've that's had some great. great shows there. Oh yeah. There, oh dude. There nice. you go. Yeah. That's one of my, that's one of my uh, photos from uh, you guys doing a, which honestly that place is epic, but um, it is. yeah, that, that was one of the uh, sound check photos you guys were checking. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that was a great show. It was a great show. Amazing, amazing place, a beautiful place, and and Detroit fans are just, man, they are so intense. It's it's great. Yeah, they are. Uh, we played Red Rocks uh, a, a couple times. That's a beautiful, beautiful place. It's pretty, 
uh, it's very impressive. You know, you're up there and, and the formation in the rocks are, are amazing. Uh, and it's kind of cool for being such a big amphitheater. The, the crowd feels as if it's very close to you because it, the, the audience is so sort of steep. Right. And uh, so that's a, that's a, a cool. That's, that's bucket list, man, for, for me personally. We've never, uh, never played there, but yeah, that's, that's up there. And I've actually, I've never been, um, my, my brother-in-law actually lives pretty close. And so the ne- in, um, in Boulder. Uh, so the next time we go out there, we're, we're wanting to take a trip out there. Of course, it's difficult to do anything now these days, but, um, you know, when things open up and start to be a, a thing, that's, that's on, that's on the list for sure. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Playing some of those uh, summer festivals in Europe is amazing, too. I don't know if you mm-hmm. guys have had the opportunity to do some of those. Yes. Yeah, so, like I remember um, a handful in Germany, um, like, um, let's see, like Grass Pop. Um, yeah, sure. I think that's, yeah. Um, and uh, that was, you know, always crazy. And the lineup is so cool because it's like as a rock fan, you get really the whole gamut of of what rock is, you know, whether it's the blues rock or the, the, the metal rock or, you know, the straight down the middle, you know, active rock. It's like, you really do get, and I love that the way that they build those uh, tickets is um, you're really getting it all. And I think that's really important. Yeah. It makes for a good experience for the fans. I think, you know, they, they get to, to see different kinds of music. And um, the people that show up are those people we were talking about that, that love that experience. They're not showing up to see, Oh, I'm, I'm, maybe they're like really excited to highlight one or two bands, but they're really there for the the whole experience and to learn to learn new music, find out new bands, you know. Yeah, I, I, I love being able to go check out new music at those festivals too. You know, just walk around to a different stage and just see what's going on up there. You know, There's yeah, same. Always, always good stuff. Yeah, absolutely, man. That's awesome. Well, I, I feel like I kind of talked about some of my favorite road stories because uh, I would talk probably talk about ACDC or you know, something like that. Um, you know, the, the other one I would probably talk about is separate from the band. Um, we got one opportunity to play a, a gig actually with Chris Cornell and to be wow. his, to be his backing band for a, a movie premiere. And um, Tyler and Graham had done some event out in LA for um, Tyler and Graham and the two guitarists in the band um, for uh, at the sunset marquee. And it was for um a book release, um, I believe it was Jimmy Page. And um, anyways, Cornell was there, um, saw the guys play. And again, Cornell just needed a, a, a band for this. It was literally, it was supposed to be one song that he wrote for the movie. And um, that's all we were doing. It was at AT&T Stadium in Arlington, Cowboy Stadium. Wow. And um, for the premiere that they showed on the big screen, and um, I think it was like two days before we flew down there to do the rehearsal. They were like, oh, by the way, we're going to add Hunger Strike to pull the dog. And, man, I remember getting that email and going, no way. Like, we get to play Hunger Strike. And Tyler was hyped because he got to sing the Eddie Vedder parts. And, and man, that, that was, you know, obviously looking back, you know, with what happened to Chris. And, you know, that's that's something that I'll always remember um, because he was so cool and, and – um, I don't know, man. It just was a really unique experience um, getting to rehearse with him. Um, again, just two songs, you know, no yeah. big, but uh, it really like I'll always remember that. Absolutely, um, that's 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 an experience you'll never forget, and, and yeah. what an amazing opportunity to be able to. Make it was music. it was re- it was really cool, man. And he was just like showed up and just cool as ever, and and played and and obviously sang. I mean, one of the best voices ever, and so oh, that was a easy. one of, one of, one of my favorite road stories for sure. What about what about shows for you guys? Do you have any shows uh, coming up? We do. For this, we have this year? we have some shows in June, end of June. Um, like so we have some weekend runs starting to slowly pop up here and there. You know, there's a lot of like protocol hoops to jump through, and and obviously we wouldn't do something that doesn't feel safe to us or to the people that are coming. So, as you know, it's like there's just kind of a lot. There's a lot that always happens regardless of the pandemic that's happening. But now with shows slowly starting to happen it's you know even more so like um safety and these things that you have to figure out um and so we're starting to see some things pop up like i said we have these three shows at the end of june which is um you know it's exciting to to see like to slowly see things starting to um kind of come back to normal um i think we'll probably start to see a little more in the fall so we'll see what about you guys well, I'm 
I'm very pleased to say that I saw a, a, a routing this morning for some shows uh, that we're going to do after Christmas time. Nice. So assuming that everything goes according to plan, uh, I, we'll we'll be doing some dates. I think after uh, after Christmas. And I think I think there was going to be a um, even more of an appreciation for when it does come back and and people are able to gather um, safely and people feel comfortable. There's going to be a, a, a real like appreciate like even deeper than there was. Yes. You know, for wow, we haven't had this and you know, a long time. And, um, I think those moments are going to be really special. And I think for us too, um, you know, we did one, we did one show last year, one, one live show in 2020. And it was a socially distanced thing. It was just outside of Nashville and it was, you know, people bought pods outdoor and, and it was weird. I, I won't lie to you, but, um, it was still so special because it was like, man, we get to do this. We get to do what we love. I know the circumstances aren't, what we'd like them to be, but still we get to play. And it's, it's about something deeper than, um, you know, the, the gig or whatever, like we're getting to have that communication with the people that we haven't seen in forever, you know? So I think people are going to really love it when it comes back. I, I know that I will. I'm going to be a really <laughs> appreciative guy for sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm never complaining about catering ever again. I'm not never going to complain about a bus driver ever again. Yeah. It does kind of put that stuff into perspective, huh? Sure does. It, abso yeah. it, it absolutely does. Because when it goes away, it's like, oh, man, you know, all the things that I maybe complained about, I miss. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're super excited about it, you know, about the idea of being able to, to, to go back again. I, I'm, I'm really hoping that, you know, things continue on the current trajectory and, I think it'll happen though. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm optimistic. Yeah, I, I, I hope so as well. And I hope too, you know, as things start to, you know, let's say come back to normal. Um, I hope we get to do some more shows together too. Oh, you I know? know we will. Yeah, we, we have to, it's such, it's such a good match, you know, mm -hmm. I, you know, like we were saying before the, 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 I think the fans from both bands appreciate the other's music. Yeah. What more, what more can you want, you know? Yeah, for sure. And I just, I loved, man, I loved watching you guys. I know I've said it already, but watching you guys every night was, was so fun. And, and you guys just put on such a great show. And I love the way you guys approach putting your set list together. Cause you got, you guys have such a massive catalog to choose from. And so, you know, if I went to see you guys three nights in a row, I'd be getting a different show. And I love bands like that. I love um, being able to have that creativity that is not tethered to, tracks or tethered to something that oh well you come to see me play for a weekend you're gonna get the same show and, and some guys are like that and again that, that's fine um or some artists or whatever but when you are putting on for you guys it keeps you you on your toes too and it keeps the audience on their toes and so um i love that experience um really having something different every single night it it keeps us engaged i think it keeps the fans engaged um We'll see how much we can do that coming up when we go back on the road. I don't know. We've been off for so long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it may start. I, I know for us, it's like, all right, cool. You get like the set that you feel good about. And then once you get in the groove, once you get in the, the momentum, you get the mojo back, then it's like, all right, we can start subbing in this, that, and the other. But definitely it'll probably be a little structured at first. And then you'll, you get your wings back and you can fly again. But, yeah. The, that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah, for sure, man. How, how are you guys about rehearsing? Are you guys good at like getting together and, and playing the songs? And we're we're not, and that's yeah, the we're truth. We're 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 not we're not we're not. And and a lot of our rehearsing is uh, we'll, we'll you know do a handful of it before we go out on the road, or um, you know we just went through um, uh, a band member change, and so there was a lot of rehearsing for that, just getting him comfortable. And um, but but yeah, we're we're not really good at rehearsing um yeah we say we're gonna re rehearse but then we end up just jamming yeah well yeah and i think that's <laughs> but again you know there, there's something to be said about that you know i mean and uh, tyler and i are together i'm probably gonna go after we're done with this i'm probably gonna go over to his house and we're gonna work more on what we've been working on it's like we're always you know there's some of us are always doing something together if we're not rehearsing songs it's something else and so just that act of playing together constantly i mean i could be i could be in australia and tyler could be in nashville and i swear to you we would 
end at the same time. And it, it's, we've been doing this. So I know you guys are the same way. You just like get in this mode of, uh, you know, the moves that they're going to make before they even make it. Right. And, um, and I, and that kind of communication on stage or uh, in the studio or whatever, um, is important. So that like kind of, let's say rehearsing happens, you know, even when we're not playing our songs. Right. Yeah, I could well, see even, even when we're jamming, you know, we, we, we need to have a reason to rehearse, you know, we, same, we, same for us. We, we've been fortunate enough to be able to stream some shows out of, out of our jam room here. Uh, we've done th- uh, three so far, three full length shows. Um, so that has given us the incentive or the motivation, I think, to, to play some of these songs. And, and it's great. It keeps, it's, it keeps you in touch with the songs a little bit, but you know, mostly at this point, we're just, we're thinking about recording a new record. We're jamming, trying to come up with new riffs and, right. you know, what's a, along that line, what's um that experience been like for you the live stream thing i know it's very different and it's been something that we've seen a lot um because we've we've done a handful i think we've done two shows um we did like a little christmas special which only 2020 would have made the shakedown do a christmas special um (laughs) but uh uh what is that what has that experience been like for you and and the guys yeah it's it well it was it was there was definitely some learning it needed to happen before we before we were able to actually stream a show. You know, we we went into this thing um, with no knowledge whatsoever of what it meant to stream a show. Um, but we we did one anyway. We just sort of jumped in. Uh, we the first one we did actually on Neil's laptop. We put a laptop in the corner of the room over there, and then we were over here playing. And that was that was it. And it was it was pretty. It was very primitive. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but we got it together with each one that we did. I th- you know, we learned a little something. We, we were able to bring down uh, our video folks that we work with and, and they helped us put some lights in here and kind of just give it a more, uh, it, a it looks a little bit more like a real show, a little bit yeah, more of a yeah, vibe, yeah. you know, yeah. it's not so much like the fluorescent lights, you know, for but- sure. For sure. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's a learning curve, isn't it? It's it just is. so interesting. It, and- it is. Like finishing the finishing the show or finishing the song and and you anticipate something. Give me something, and it's yeah. and it's nothing, you know. And I know when we were filming our our album release, um, you know, Tyler's like introducing songs, and it was awkward at first. You know, we're we're going, you know, there's some people in the room with cameras and whatnot, but it's like, you know, we're kind of laughing and we. Big outro and boom, we'd end it. And it's like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one guy in the back, you know? Yeah. And so it's it's just different, man. It's just different. But uh but hey, you know, if we get to do it, you know, that's that's gotta say something, right? That's so. it. That's it. And and you know, us as band guys, I think it, it just keeps us in touch with that feeling of, you know, getting together with 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 your buddies, playing the music that you made together. Um, that's, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta nurture that, man. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta cultivate that. Cause it's, for sure. it's, it's important. And, it, and it's been important. I'm sure for you guys, like, like we said, just to, just to keep us in that motion of playing and obviously give our fans some, some content and, and, um, you know, I, I don't know. I just think for, for us to not lose that, um, that touch, you know, I know like for us, even we made the record earlier in the year and playing the songs was like, Oh, we haven't played these songs live yet, you know, but live, live was in a, in a photo studio with cameras in front of us. So we're going, well, this is weird, you know? And so it's like, cause as we play the songs live, they start to evolve into something else and they didn't really get that chance to evolve in the one show. Maybe they did in rehearsal, but you know, I'm excited to when we finally do get in front of people and start to play these these songs live. You know, let's say live in person, um, yeah. they'll start to take on a new uh, a new. Um, it, it, they'll just be basically evolve in a new way. You know, Is, it, isn't it cool how how you know you have an idea in the jam room with your with your buddies? You think, all right, yeah, we we got something to go in here. This is a this is a cool vibe. This is a cool song, and then you put it on stage, and that thing just becomes a completely different animal. Yes. Uh, you, yes. You learn immediately what, what a song is made of as yeah. soon as you get out there. And Absolutely. And it's, for, it's, for, uh, for better or worse. I mean, we've done some where it's yeah. like, oh, man, this is this is it. This is the vibe. And we play it live and it's like, we, we'll never do that again. Yeah, <laughs> you know crickets. I mean? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. 
Yeah, it's it's um, it's for us. It's a little bit. It's almost like a laboratory, you know. Like you come up with these theories, and then you get out there and, and you you play them in, in front of the audience, and that's really when where the song comes to life. You know, I I it, immediately I can tell if my choice of tempo was the correct choice, right? Uh, and 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 not just from the crowd's reaction, but the way that the guys are playing. I can tell right away. Like, all right, right, people want to play this song faster. You know, right, right. <laughs> Um, I can relate to that, man. Totally, sure. you know, but but you don't, you don't get that experience unless you really get out there and you and you put it on the stage in front of people and and get that interaction th- that happens. That you know, it's so it's so precious and man, I miss it so much. I'm, yeah, I miss that I, I, I agree, man. And and again, you know, I said this already, but that's that's the beauty too that we have that we both are, you know in a similar fashion um, have with these songs is it's like you know depending night to night, you know. One song can feel, oh man, really on the back, back end, like we're really laying this back. And then maybe some night we finish one song that's in a different spot in the set list and, and I'm excited and all of a sudden it feels like it's more brisk and it's like it takes on another life. You know, when, when we're not tethered to that and we've, we didn't, we haven't gotten into this, but, um, you know, that's, we've tried the click thing live and, you know, there was a time where we tried some tracks and it's just been just horrible like just like we are just not the band for that and i know that some bands are but like when you're not tethered to that it really does allow you to um have those moments that are more sporadic and more um organic or more just you know kind of off the cuff um where tyler's like i'm soloing and i'm soloing until i'm not soloing anymore you know what i mean to where it's not like oh you were it's it's, it's eight bars or whatever and it's like dude it's 270 something bars, you know, and he's like in it and he doesn't know where the turn has started. And, you know, and so we're just, we're on it. All right. We're, you know, and that's the throw of the hand up and we're okay. Next section, you know? And so when you're not tethered to those things, it's um, I think the music can, can, can be a lot more fun night to night, you know, when, when you're on your toes and everybody's interacting and communicating. Right. It's, it's a, it's an organic thing. Yes. Yeah. The yeah. back and forth flow of energy. Hey, Jessica. Exactly. For sure. Exactly. How about uh, how about gear? What, what, gear. What, Let's uh, talk gear. What are, what are you playing these days? Um, the drums. So uh, I, these days I'm playing a, a Brooklyn kit. It's actually this huh? this guy here in sky blue. Um, this is a 26. I don't take this on the road much. That's why it's in this room. Um, I take the 24 on the road. Um, but... Uh, I got when I got the kit. Oh, yeah, so there's our, our one show. There's Tyler in the back. Um, so I've been kind of experimenting. Can we throw that photo back up real quick? So I've been experimenting with a couple things. Uh, LP sent me one of those little street cans, which has been kind of cool. Um, you may remember, JP, there's a, a song that we have where I set a cymbal on a floor tom. And it's, yep. it's kind of like my um, – you know, it gives this cool, like warbly sort of sound. And um, I, I started adding a second because I don't have a second floor tom on this Brooklyn kit. And I wanted to before I ordered one, I wanted to try it. Um, the street can's cool. And it, you can have those with the gong drum. You have those extra accents if you, if you want to throw them in. Um, so, you know, I'm sure I'll probably order a, a floor to, to match. But um, I don't hit it a ton other than, you know, here and there. But, um, but yeah, just 13, 16, 24. I love the bell brass snare. It's been awesome. I remember um, that, that, that drum on tour. Is that still your sort of go-to drum? Yeah, it's been actually in the stream because we were in the photo studio. And, man, that bell brass is, like, just the loudest thing on planet Earth. And it's and it oh yeah so there's the unboxing, um, yeah a beautiful kit and and I love I just love that finish so much, um, and man it's crazy I mean that was years ago um, when I was going back I was like reminiscing going back finding all these photos for for this, um, but I actually used the chrome over brass for our our stream and when we go to Europe I always fly with the chrome over brass because the bell brass is too heavy. So, um, so I, I, I kind of go back, I go through phases where I'm like, oh, I, I have to use this drummer. And then there's a moment where I'll throw the bell brass up and I'm like, oh, I can't hit another drum other than this drum right now, you know? Right. And so it, it's those like kind of, uh, phases that I go through, but, but yeah, that's the kit that I'm using here in the States. And actually over in Europe, I took a, I think we have a picture of that too. I have a Renown 
over there that basically li that lives over there. Um, so we don't have to, man, I know you've gone through it too, but you know, doing the backline gear is like, it's not great, man. It's no, just man, not it's great. Fun. And, it, and not, not only do you pay just out the, you know what, but it's just the, the, the quality of the stuff just isn't always the best. And, you know, tension rods are different sizes and, you know, you change heads and it's just like, man, what is going on with this rim and, and, or, or with the, the shell itself. And, and so, and two to find the sizes that you want, it's just, you know, and, and then when you do find the size, it's like, man, that color really come on, you know? And, and so, <laughs> you know, um, so to have something that, that also is just familiar always that, that I know is going to be great. And that, that I know that I'm comfortable with is awesome because the more and more that we've been touring over there, um, the more I've been like yearning for that experience because, you know, it takes me like a couple weeks to like, okay, I finally feel comfortable behind this rental kit, you know, and there, you know, it's great. So it's like always great, you know, to some degree, but still it's like, it's not like mine, you know? So to have that is, is important and, and I'm stoked to finally have it. Um, what about you, man? What are you playing? I know, I know we were talking about this before we hopped on, but. Yeah. Tell them. Tell the great people out there. Well, well if further to your to your point about having you know having gear in Europe, um, it, not only it, does it make you feel more comfortable, but 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 financially, it's 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 the right move because you know you got people maybe don't don't think about the the expenses that go into putting a band on tour. You know, getting to Europe is very costly just in plane flights alone. But then once you get there, you have to have gear to to play on. Rental gear is also expensive, man. That, man, that, the, with our first tour over there, we were talking about the ACDC thing. Of course, you yeah. know, my uh, God love them, the guitar players in, in our band, Tyler and Graham. We have to have the biggest amp rig that there ever was, you know, because you're, you're keeping up with, you know, the, the heavy hitters. So, Understandable. You know, and I remember our, our um, you know, when we're going back and looking at budgets and stuff for, for now, obviously we have our, our gear over there. Thankfully, like you said, it's the it's the smart financial move. But it's funny thinking back because it's like, wait, what was that bill in 2016? What? Yeah. You know, yeah. it's crazy, man. It's crazy. So it it makes it makes sense to get a kit that that you feel comfortable on and, and have it stay there. Um, and that you know, and that way you know what you're getting into when you fly over there. I I've got a uh, a Brooklyn series kit in uh, in England now, and that so that's my European kit. That one nice. is. Uh, uh it's oyster cream finish nice uh, yeah it kind of looks like uh i got it because it sort of looked like bill ward's yeah pearl, man pearl finish yep uh, that's that renown it's like the, i think they call it vintage pearl i got this when i was doing the renown shoot i remember shreve was like dude you keep calling it like white marine pearl it's not that i think it's vintage pearl is what they call the renowned version of of that kind of like um your as you said like oyster cream but yeah I yours is it. yeah, Andrew. Yours is vintage pearl. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that that is uh, fourteen twenty six, uh, ten fourteen, sixteen sixteen, and eighteen eighteen. And um, I've got a, I got a six and a half chrome over brass snare over there too. Yeah, great, great drums, man. That's kind that's, of my that's, go to. Yeah, that's the same, honestly, or at least right now. I love my chrome over brass. It's actually back here, but it's the, um, you know, it's an older one. Um, but, man, it's just stood the test of time, man. Just a yeah, great drum. Great. It get, it, I feel like you got all the, you have all the, that crack and attack that you get with a with a metal drum. Um, and then you get a little bit of that that warmth as well, too, you know, that, that body, brass. right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, I love it. I love it. It's the just tuning responsive. Range, yeah. Responsive. That's another thing, but the tuning range is also really great with honestly the bell brass too. Surprisingly, uh, that thing tunes down. Awesome. Um, and sounds great. I, you know, I, live, I don't use it that way, but in the studio, sometimes you want that kind of guttural, like fat sound and that, that drum tunes down great. Yeah, you it, know? it does. It does. Um, here in the States, I'm playing, uh, uh, USA customs. I've got mm. this kind of a little bit of a Frankenstein kit here. I've got a, uh, I've got a blue tom tom and a red bass drum, and right now both very, tom toms are <laughs> very patriotic. JP, <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> uh, you know what it is? I got different microphones in inside different bass drums, and rather than rather than pull the microphone out and put it in a different bass drum. I just swap out the bass drum now. Yeah. Yeah. So, Hey, so did you have, um, uh, 
uh, if you have them inside, is it the Kelly shoe system or do you have something uh, else? No, this is just one that sits on a, on a foam pad that we've oh, got I see. In, I see. inside there. Gotcha. Um, it's one of, it's, it's the Sennheiser, Sennheiser version of the sort of that flat inside mic. You know, I forget what the number is. The, the 91. That's the one. Yeah. yeah. And on its own, it sounds terrible, actually. Right. But but couple that with uh, with an RE20 on the on the resonant yep. side of the bass drum, and then between those two mics, you get a, a pretty yeah, good thing you, going. You, with the 91, it can be somewhat uh, too attacky. You know, you yeah. get that like the the beater hitting, and you need the warmth of the kick, and you need to let the kick air out right so with that mic in front is great for sure that that makes all the difference having that other you know on its own it's pretty useless actually yeah right <laughs> unless you're uh throwing a sample on it no yeah, yeah. um so are on the the book of bad decisions tour that we were on together were you playing i can't remember were you playing a 26 are you, are you all okay you're always using a 26 yeah uh, pretty pretty much 26 or 24 this this happens to be a 24 here that's that's a 24 in the photograph Okay. That's the bass drum that that came with the with the Tom Toms. <laughs> yeah. The, right the, on. Um yeah, um twenty fours or twenty sixes, you know, that's kind of kind of my go to. I I switch between the two. I just one day I think the twenty six is totally where it's at and I can't believe I would play any other drum and then one day I come in here and say, No, maybe I want to try the twenty four. So question for you, because I, I feel like some some uh some of my students have asked me this, like What's the, because especially like in a studio setting, and I know with Vance, especially, you know, going back to us both making records with him, you know, there's a different way to play a big open 26, right? Yeah. Versus like a more punchy 24 with a hole cut in the front. There's a, there's a, a, a response that's a lot different. You know, talk to me about like kind of your approach with um, getting like super nerdy here, but your approach with like, what does it feel like when you, when you get on stage and you have the 26 versus what it feels like when you have the 24? Right. Uh, the 26 is just a completely different animal. I, I yeah. can remember, uh, I can remember in my, in my young days going from a 22 to a 24. And I remember thinking, wow, that's a big difference. The 24 sound wise, of course, was a much bigger drum, but, mm -hmm. but it required more of you physically, you know, to, mm -hmm. to move air in, in the setting of a rock band, you know, right. in, in this thing that we do here. Um, when I, when I went from a 24 to a 26, for me, the, the jump was even greater. It was, right. it was, there's a huge difference between a 24 and a 26. Um, I, it's a 26. You, you really have to articulate what it is you're trying to say on that bass drum. You cannot mm -hmm. half step at all. You've got right. to make that bass drum speak in the way that you want it to. Um, I, I like to play my bass drums with no hole in the front head whatsoever. So that, that also adds in a, a lot of, a lot of sort of feedback from the drum itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, you got to be aware of how, how you're going to hit the drum. So if I'm going to, if I'm playing heel down, you know, I'm really, I'm really trying to articulate that. I'm not, I'm really making sure that, that the beater comes off of that drum because right. if, you, if you let it even hit it, you know, if, if, if you don't pull it off the drum right away, you're going to sort of get that clacky sound. That's, that's not right. Very, very or like cool. a, like a flammy, you know, and, and yeah. under a mic, man, it's a completely different thing. Yes. Right? Yes. It's, it's not a pleasant sound. You, you want to stay away from that. And and by the same token, you know when when I'm playing heel up, and I'm really trying to bury that beater, you've got to bury that beater, and you got to make sure that when you hit that bass drum, that beater stays right there. It does not slap back or uh, give you that flammy sound. Um, and a, a big bass drum just seems to articulate that even more. I think you know uh, the 24. I, th I think works in some settings, especially in the studio. I, I feel like it it might fit into a mix a little better depending on the song or, or the vibe that you're trying to go for. A 26, I think, uh, uh, takes up a very different space in the mix and the relationship mm -hmm. that it has with the bass and, and the guitars to some degree too, I think is, is totally different. So there are two, although both big drums, you know, but two are, they serve very different purposes and I think have very different voices. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, my Brooklyn is that. And it's like when we're going for, when we just made the this last record that we put out into the into last year, um, when we were in lockdown, 
you know, same deal. It was like, all right, what are we going for? And we saved the songs on the record that have the 26 until the end. Cause we got our like 24 and we got like a sound that we loved and, and a mic placement that we loved. And it was like, all right, let's save the more like airy, you know, muff or, um, uh, soft beater kind of open, you know, where I'm just playing a super sick kick pattern or a uh, simple kick, super sick, super <laughs> simple. Kick. It was super sick. Uh, a, super, <laughs> a super simple kick pattern where it's just like really open. You're, you're letting the, the drum breathe, you yeah. know, um, you know, we save those for the end and, and you're right. Like they, they do take different space, you know, um, and the way that I had that drum tune, but you know, again, it can be that, you know, big rock, you know, open bottom kind of sound as well, you know, with the more attacky beater and, and, you know, if you're bearing it or if you're not, I remember, man, the first record talking about Vance, the first record that we made with him, this was in his old studio. So it was actually down the street from what we know as Sputnik, um, uh -huh. that, that I think believe now is a house of blues studio but still in the same area. And this was 2012 when we made this record. And uh, it's what started our relationship with him. And um, again, we tracked the whole record to tape. So there were no edits, um, all live, uh, on the floor. And I remember it was really the first time that I had really experienced that um, relationship with, uh, to the depth that I did. Um, learn it um, with the, the burying versus pulling off. And I, and there's, if you go back and listen to that record, it's called wild child. Um, there are songs on there where I'd be playing an open uh, one that comes to mind as lipstick wonder woman, where I'm playing this rim groove and you can hear when I, when I bury versus when I pull. And it's kind of interesting. And, and, and everyone asks like, did you do that on purpose? And I say, yes, but the truth is, is that I didn't uh, do it on purpose. Um, because it, it there's like and it's kind of all over the place, but it does give this unique kind of like it doesn't breathe, it breathes. And so this like with the syncopation and and they're not in like a a, a spot that I chose. They're just however I played it, I played it. Yeah. Um, but you know that was when I really my eyes were opened. I remember going back and listening, going, oh whoa, like that that the way the drum responds, you know, especially under these like really high fidelity microphones you're really hearing that because maybe in the room you don't obviously right under headphones. It's even hard with the band, but then you crank that through the speakers with the sub and it's like, Whoa, you're really getting that. So I remember that really for me honed it in where I was like, all right, I, I really have to practice this. You know, I really have to practice knowing when I want, like you said, when I want this sound and when I want this sound. Right. Yeah. I think just being aware of that is helpful. You know, yeah. just 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 sitting at the kid and just knowing that there's a difference happening there, that 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 will get you halfway there. I think just just yeah. being aware of it, and of course practicing yeah, too. Yeah, of course, of course. So t tell me about your um, your first scratch because I know that's that was like uh, we sent in pictures for that, and you have to tell or have to show the picture that you have. <laughs> the picture is ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> well, my my first kit was a Gretsch kit. But it, but it had other brands in there too. And I, when you see the photo, you'll see what I mean. It was, it was really a, a oh man, look at that. Thing. Just, just a legendary <laughs> photo, man. So the, the, the bass drum, the tom tom, the floor tom, those are, those are Gretsch drums. Um, and then we've got some sort of like no name off brand thing over there to the, like the eight and the 10 tom toms, those little ones. Yeah, uh, that bass drum. I'm not sure what it was to be honest with you. That my friend had a, a little 20 inch bass drum, and I was like, "Yeah, I'll, I'll add that to kit to the kit." Uh, back then, quality was not important whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> I just hey, wanted man. more. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was gonna say. When I first started playing, man, it was like, "What can I add today?" You know, yeah. it was like, "Let's have the biggest setup possible." You know, two ride cymbals. I remember at one point I had like three or four snare drums, right? It's just like, you know, placed every which way, five toms, you know, and now I'm like, I might lugging that stuff around. I'm, I'm taking oh. kick, kick snare hat. Man, if I could live, I know there was a tour that we did um, that we kind of had to fit. I don't think we could take a trailer. And so I did. I did kick snare hat floor ride. 
And that was like what I used. And, um, and again, you, you approach everything way differently, don't you? Cause it really, you, you don't have that, the gear as a crutch anymore. It's all about like, Totally. You know, the feel or groove or whatever. Yeah. I think back then I wasn't even thinking about that. I just wanted to be surrounded by drums. <laughs> so did I. That's what I'm saying. You know, but I'm just, I'm saying now the, 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 uh, the approach is way different. You know, oh, absolutely. I know, absolutely. I know when I was 12 years old, I wanted the same deal. Give me everything, all the pedals, all the everything. All, all the stuff. Yeah. And then I all immediately the painted everything uh, with, with automotive spray paint, you know, like, and the, the Gretsch drums were actually beautiful drums. They were they were blonde, uh, natural finish drums. You know, really really nice. And of course, I spray painted them. Do you still have those drums today? Or I or do not? not have those drums. No, I, no unfortunately, I, I wish I did. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Well, my my first, I still have it. Actually, it's it's stacked up back here in the back. But um, it's it was a new classic. I got it in 09 when I signed on. I think we got a photo of it somewhere or a couple photos. Nice. Um, yeah. So road um, and, and the story of the gong drum. Yeah. So, so the one to the left, um, that was like our wayside, the, the handprint. Um, I know you see the handprint, the OG handprint back here um, on the wall, but, um, yeah. but yeah, so, so that's a uh, 24, actually 24, 12, 16. So when I first signed on to Gretsch, they, that was the, the kit that I got, the kit they sent to me. And at the time, I was still at school. I was still going to Belmont. And so I lived in the dorm room. So the kit was sent to the um, on-campus uh, post office, right? Oh. So I, I, like, showed up. And, I, man, it was like a kid on Christmas morning, obviously. And, I, dude, I had no room to put the kit up, it really, in my dorm room. But I did it anyways. I, I, my, I told my roommate, cause actually we did, um, we had conjoining rooms and, and we, we all knew each other. So we all moved our beds into one room. And after I got the kit and made the, the second room, like a little hang studio space so we could nice. have stuff set up all the time. And so I was able to set the, the kit up and I remember setting it up and I didn't pay attention to what time it was. And man, I just started rocking. And our RA, boom, 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 bang on the door. Hey, man, quiet hours. You can't be playing that thing right now. You know, so it, was, it wasn't until, like, I think the next week that we had rehearsal, like, before a tour that I was finally able to play it. You know, Ooh. it was, like, pretty, like, pretty big of a bummer. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but, yeah, I still – I love that kit. I um, still use it often. I don't take it on the road, but I still use it in the studio a lot. And, nice. and that kick drum sounds great. It's 18 by 24, so it's bigger. But um, I never wanted to – yeah, so th there's a little overhead shot of it. Um, there you go. That was nice. actually at Blackbird here in Nashville. Um, and that was that was actually a session that we did with Andy Johns. Oh, wow. Um, about a year before he passed. Um, we did three songs with him. And you notice in the photo, the red wood beater. He was, he was so adamant. He told me before he got in the studio, he was like, you have to have a wood beater. And I've never played with a wood beater ever in my whole life. Really? I was like, I was like, all right. He was just, he was like something about the, it was like his old like studio trip, you know, something about the attack of it was that what he wanted to hear. So, um, but yeah, rest in peace, Andy Jones. But yeah, that was a, a really interesting um, couple days with him because his, you know, he's recorded some legends and, and the stories that we heard and just the experience in general was one that amazing. I'll never, never forget. Wow, what um, an amazing experience to be able to spend time with yeah, him. And, really, and really cool. That's so great. Cool. Yeah, man, this has been fun. This is yeah. great. Yeah. Are we are we taking uh, – are, are there any questions or, or, or are we doing that, Jules? What type of – what type of USA kit for live in studio? Uh, so uh, – Right now, I'm playing uh, f one of two bass drums. I got a, either 1424 or 1426. And then the Tom Toms are usually 1014. Uh, I think on this kit here, it's the, the floor toms are 1416 and then 1618. So they're a little bit more shallow. They're, they are a little faster. Um, I'm not sure they sound better than, you know, 16, 16 or 18, 18. Just a little different. Um, so 
those those are the drum sizes, and then the and then the snare drum changes all the time. Uh, right now, I've got a solid steel uh, five and a half uh, mm. by fourteen. Nice, and I like that drum a lot. Super heavy, uh, man. Really, really loud. It's got a great, great backbeat. Yeah, and then um, I'll switch between that and then the the chrome over brass, like we were talking about before. I've got the uh, forty one sixty, the sort yeah. of you know, five and a half by 14, you know, and that thing's just a workhorse, man. I can get it to do whatever I need it to do. As far as tuning goes, it plays great. And, um, I love that sort of little bit of that ring that it's got in it. You know, it sounds so nice when you put a little compression on that snare drum and that thing yep. just, it's really, really nice. I love, I love that, man. That was one thing that we would always do with, with, with Vance is just like kind of dial in the ring, but also kind of not dial in the ring to where it kind of like has this air about it that, you know, I remember he would always go, hey, the, the tension rod that's closest to where you're cracking, can you just like tune it down so you get this like wow kind of vibe? And but under a mic, like oh, with compression, like through Vance's little sprinkle to taste, you know, wizard stuff that he's got going on, it would just be like so cool and have like a, a, a cool vibe. Again, like the left to center kind of things like let's make it sound like a snare drum. Let's make it sound different than most snare drums. You know, yeah. I love I love that. He, he had me do a very similar thing, you know, tune the snare drum, tune the snare drum lower than I'd ever really tuned a drum before. So the whole thing was just sort of rattling. And then the bass drum heads were, it seemed like they were just getting ready to fall off. I know, they, dude. They I know. so loose. Yeah. And, and I thought like, there's no sound coming out of that. How does that, right. how does that? No, it, he, he knew how to, he knew how to pull the sound out of that drum. And so I still tune my drums that to that. That, that same way now. I learned a lot from this. Yeah, same. And I was actually, um, I have a personal question that I want to ask you because I know on the, the tour, I noticed that you were night to night changing your approach to tuning and trying things out, um, whether the relationship was different from top to bottom. Like, and I know I would always notice that you spent a lot of time on your two floor times. Um, and I know I asked you a couple questions, you know, I'd come up on stage and pick your brain. But what is what is that approach, or does it change, or uh, you know, are you trying things for for your front of house guy, or for you, or or you know, how does that work? It, it definitely changes. It it, it changes mm -hmm. from night to night. Uh, you know, it, I feel like a stage always makes your drum sound a little different. You know, yeah, room definitely where you're factors at. in. You, you hear different stuff in the drums, you know. Um, so I'm always I'm always thinking about that, and I'm just trying to make trying to make those drums just really pop, you know, and. Um, I just experiment a lot with tuning. I don't really have a, a, a specific technique. <clears throat> Sometimes I'll try to tune to certain pitches. And I think I was experimenting with that when I was on tour with you guys. Yeah. Trying to figure out the relationship between the, 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 the resonant head and the batter head and how those two work together. <clears throat> I, th I yeah. think in general, I like to have the, the resonant, the resonant side just a little higher than the, uh, than the than the batter side, you know, and I, and I experiment with different different um, tensions, you know. So yes. I think sometimes I was trying to tune a third above the the batter head. <clears throat> sometimes I'm just trying to tune a half step or something like that. But right, it's it's more of just an experiment, you know. This thing is the, the drums are so great because you never you never know at all. There's always more to try to try to learn, and tuning is part of that. I think. A absolutely. I, I, I agree completely. For sure. Love it. I love the halftime shuffle that opens. Give me the keys. Uh, what kit did you record that track with? Uh, well, cool. Thank you. Um, the halftime shuffle <clears throat> is a, that's, that's a thing I've been working on for many, many years. It's a Bernard Purdy kind of a groove. Um, and so we we recorded a few measures of that, and then <clears throat> Vance, of course, destroyed it with this sort of bit crusher kind of a sound. Um, but that kit was actually the same kit. That's the Gretsch USA kit, and that was the big bass drum. That was the fourteen by twenty six bass drum. Great bass groove, crusher. great great sound. I know exactly what he's talking about. But yeah, the, a groove that every drummer works on, right, or should work on. Cool. That so least. it's and it's so tough to make it sound good. And there's you know? and there's so many ways to approach it too, right? Yes. I remember practicing it for hours and hours and hours. And then I go to YouTube and put on the Bernard Purdy video where he 
breaks down the groove and thinking, geez, I've, I've learned nothing, you know? <laughs> well, well I, I think if we're talking about the same video, I remember there was this drummer um, he uh, that I talked to one time. Uh, he was in this band called Mute Math. He's not in the band anymore. Darren King, I'm sure some people watching know who I'm talking about. And uh, I remember um, it was a, a, a some other drummer. It was like, you know, a bunch of drummers hanging around. And somebody said to him, like, how do you – if you ever have like a, you hit a wall in your um, practice or you're on the road and you, and you kind of hit a, a lull, like, how do you get out of it? And he was like, I turn on that Bernard Purdy YouTube video and it always makes me smile. And I realize that, that, that music is, is bigger and, and, you know, it's, it's more than, you know, maybe whatever space he was living in. And I was like, man, I love that. And because that video is so legendary for all the reasons, but, but yeah, his, just his energy uh, in that video is awesome. No doubt about it. So it's such an, or a, a source of inspiration and, and, and for me, sometimes frustration as well. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. For sure. Yeah, that's great. But, but the, in a good way, in a good way. Who are your influences? What about you, JP? Uh, Bill Ward, Ginger Baker. Uh, Elvin Jones, Jack DeJanet, Earl Hudson. Nice. I, I would definitely say Elvin Jones. And actually, I've, I've kind of gotten back into that. Don't play a lot of jazz. I, used, I, I grew up on jazz, right? So like, that was like how I started. So one of my favorite drummers still to this day is Steve Gadd. And because he did a little bit of both, right? He did the jazz thing, but he also, you know, did the, did the rock thing, you know? And um, so I love Steve Gadd. Um, I love Vinnie Caliuta, um, John Paul Gaster. <laughs> um, man, I, I love uh, I love Keith Moon. Um, obviously Bonham, but man, I, I really looked up to those jazz cats. Man, Max Roach. Um, yeah, even Buddy Rich. You know. What about what about what was the first time you you went to a show? You know, and I'm not even really talking about a concert. I'm talking about being like a, as a as a young drummer going to a show and being able to stand close to a drummer that just really knocked you out. Mm. Do, you, do you remember those times? Um, I I do actually. Um, and now it, it is not a show. All right, it's a little different. Um, but you know, I, I was when I was young and, and starting. I remember being 13 years old and I went to a clinic, a drum clinic. It was in wow. Lexington where I grew up, and it was Terry Bozio. Oh and, goodness. and, and it was literally dude, his kit took up the entire stage. And I remember it was like his time to play. And, um, he could like, there was no backstage door for him to walk like that. So he walked from literally the front of the club and he walked past me. And I remember he looked like larger than life. Cause he wore the, the combat boots, like to his knees, you know, just like, how do you play in the, this stuff? Dude? Yeah. You know, and he's got the dozen pedals or whatever that he has. And man, I, I remember just like, and you know, not to get into his playing, but, and I, and I, and I love his playing. Like it didn't like, uh, influence me maybe like in, in that way. But I remember, uh, you know, it's so like orchestral the way that he approaches the drums. It's not like a drummer. He's like a musician. Um, it's, you know, with the, harmonies that he has in his toms and his cymbals, like everything's tuned to a certain pitch. And um, I remember just being enamored by just the whole experience and just the way that he approached. Um, that's honestly the first thing that popped in my head mm -hmm. um, because I was so um, influenced at that time, just like, cause I just didn't know how anything worked. I just really got a kit and like started playing and, and, um, and that was when and actually the same thing happened uh, with Steve Gadd, uh, several, several years later, he did a clinic, um, in this like symphony hall in Lexington again. And I remember he was like 45 minutes late. So it started like seven and he like rolled out like 10 minutes to eight and he came and he sat down behind the kit and he picked up a pair of brushes and just started playing this like simple little soupy jazz thing. And dude, I swear to you, he played it for like 10 15 minutes just just this just this just sinking into it right and i remember going like what, what is he doing you know like what why is he why is he just and he he was locked in right zoned in right and then all of a sudden he leaned over he had a mic and he started singing like um 
like melodic patterns. Wow. You know, and it was like it, it it like really hit me, man, because I was like, whoa, like it's just so much more than I think showy drummer stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, and that that really hit me too. It, it, it's those you know those first experiences that we have are, you know, they're, they are so precious, and they and they really feel like they they. They inspire us and and they influence us for for longer than I think we even really understand. You know? I agree, and and I don't know that we realize the true effect until maybe in hindsight or later on. You know, for sure. When you look back and you're like, wow, that actually really did kind of mold something in me that I just didn't realize at the time. In uh, in 1989, I just graduated high school, and I, I was just starting to see shows, you know, starting to go down to the 930 Club in Washington, D.C. And um, that was huge. You know, I'd drive, I'd get in my car and I'd drive the 45 minutes down there and go see a gig. And a lot of times I'd even just do it by myself. You know, I didn't even have friends that would go with me. I would just be like, whatever, I'll go on my own if you guys can't make it. Uh, but I used to go down there a lot in those early days. I got to see one time, I got to see the original Bad Brains lineup at the 930 Club. So cool. And, you know, I'd, I'd heard about the Bad Brains. I'd listened to some Bad Brains before then. Um, Dan, actually, our uh, bass player in Clutch, he, he turned me on to the Bad Brains. Okay. Uh, so I, I, I knew about them, and I, I knew about their music. Um, but the thing that happened that night on that stage for me was, that was church. Yeah. I, I saw that, and I thought to myself, that is what I want to do. Right. Um, and Earl Hudson, the drummer for the Bad Brains, is one of my favorite drummers. Um, he, uh, the the way he played that music, I think, was 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 um, unique to himself. Uh, he, the, the Bad Brains played with intensity and speed that was completely unmatched. Um, but they did it with a a, a a clarity and an articulation that a lot of the other bands didn't have. Right. And and Earl's playing that night just blew me away. I, I wow. couldn't believe that you could be that intense, uh, but still that that in control of what was happening. Um, so I, you know, I, I think about that night a lot. I think about I think about how those guys transformed uh, the 650 people uh, that were jammed into a club that was only supposed to have 300 people in it. Right. How, you know right. how they, they they transformed this this mass of people uh, into. You know, it, it was it was a for me it was a religious experience. It, it was it was something that I had not seen before, and I didn't know that music could music could be that powerful. Yeah. So I, th I think I think a lot about that that show in particular. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I, the word that comes to mind of all the things you just explained is intentional, and I feel like as a drummer, for me, you know, especially you know since I moved to Nashville and and you know, you, you're always learning. And I, I think we've said that we're, I think it's important to always be learning, but to always approach the music that you're playing with intentionality, right. To, to approach it, like, not like the drummer drummer, but like a song drummer, you know, to, to um, be intentional about your parts. And I, and I feel like when you're explaining, you know, this guy, it's, that's, that's kind of what he's doing is, is playing everything with meaning. Every note has a purpose and every non note has a purpose, right? Everything that's not there has a purpose. Right. And, and that's important too, just as important, if not more so. I just got a spam call. Don't you hate those? I uh, do. I, I can't even tell. <laughs> God, it's so annoying. I can't tell you how many of those I get every day, man. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, but but back to what we were saying. You're right. There's there's. I think there should be some intention in the music, and there should be. Uh, it, it's the drums for me is not a selfish instrument. We're here to support the other band members, you know. Mm -hmm. And I totally appreciate that that kind of drumming that involves a lot of chops and and a lot of uh, those those kinds of things. And and I, there are some great drummers out there that I think are really good at that. Um, 
but but for me, you know, the drums is it's it's a rhythm instrument, man. We're we're here to make we're here to make the singer sound good. We're here to make the guitarist sound good. Make everybody in the room feel like they've made the right musical choices when they play what it is they play. I want them to feel like, yeah, that was the right thing to do because the drums are kicking ass right now, and that's right. you know. Um, but but you know, go, going back to what we were saying about the bad brains, there was there was a musicality there. There was there was a there was an emphasis on the song. Um, and, and not just about being fast. Right. I love that, man. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. What else we got? We got any, any more questions? I think we're about ready to wrap this up, Caleb. Dude, this has been fun, man. And yeah, the, man. Truth, the truth is, JP, is that I, I could sit here and talk to you all day. Well, you know. I'm we can continue to do this after the people go home. <laughs> <laughs> Let the people go back home and, yeah. and go to work or doing whatever they're doing. Yeah, this but, has been uh, great, man. I've, I've, I've very much enjoyed it. It's been it's been great spending time with you. Uh, I'm hoping that the next time we see each other is at a venue and we're getting ready to play a gig. Agree, man. I, I, I hope the same. I really do. And uh, you can check out our band on all these uh, things that you're seeing across the screen. But yeah, man, I just, uh, I appreciate you. I, I admire you. Um, I, I, I love what you and the guys do and, and love your music. Our, our, all of, you know, I know all the guys say, Hey, they, they told me, tell JP, we said, Hey, um, so, you know, uh, we're, uh, we're big fans of you guys and thanks for taking us on the road and, and obviously getting to do this with you is awesome. So, well, let's, let's do it again. It's been, it's been a pleasure it. and an honor. Thank you. Absolutely, man. Well, right. thanks for tuning in guys. See you all around. Take care.